Bishop of Secular Colossus for Secure Communication by Sean Kennedy, William Clef, 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 Clef Nikov, Gordon Woodfall. William will give us a talk. circuit-based uh, 
for example, garble circuit, simply because the basic step is so is so fast. But um, when we are looking at some applications <coughs> that don't map very well in circuits, so that some applications, some functions f are not well represented in Boolean circuits, and this is where we're beginning to have uh, problems. And one very well recognized issue with uh, representing the function as Boolean circuits is the random access. And uh, people, you know, so this, this line of work on oblivious RAM uh, addresses that there's a, there's a long line of work and uh, uh, it, it's really uh, celebrated and really important. And what, so what's the issue there with the random access? And the issue there is that um, the circuits, um, they, they access a specific data element. Uh, that's how they're, they're programmed. Uh, that's how they're designed. That's, that's what they do. And whenever you want to access, uh, let's say, an element of an array, then we are a little bit stuck because um, if that element, if that array element is indexed by some private variable, some private uh, index inside the computation, then we cannot go directly and retrieve that uh, that data point, that the data. Right, so because that will reveal information about our internal state. So what we have to do, um, sort of naively, we just scan the entire memory and then we multiply out the data that we want to get. And then the oblivious RAM uh, line of work improves the asymptotics of that by uh, 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 at the cost of, of having a much more expensive this, uh, this basic step. Um, but this is. Uh, uh, I wanted to mention it as a kind of another example of what people look at that, that deals with the issues of, uh, of, of function presentation of Boolean circuits. And what we focus on today is that if you have conditional statements, if you have conditional uh, uh, conditions in your uh, function, then when you put it into the circuit representation, then you're going to have to pay a penalty. And um, so to illustrate this, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear, but you know, you know let's, let's visualize this. Um, so let's look at, a, at an example, but it should be clear that this example you know, naturally generalizes <coughs> to, to, to many settings that we want to think about. Uh, so let's look at a semi-private function um, evaluation. So this is where uh, one player knows which of the uh, functions uh, they want to compute and the other player uh, doesn't. Um, again, it will be clear later that it applies to, to general security. So, all right, so let's say we have uh, the two players have the function big F. That is basically a collection of uh, functions small f that are indexed by the choice bit or bits uh, c, right? So that's matter what these functions are. Um, so this study was actually motivated by um, our work, uh, my prior work on, on private uh, databases, where the database client wanted to uh, to query the database, and the query was implemented as a uh, as a garbled circuit. So the policy, the database policy, would allow, let's say, 30 different uh, types of queries. Each would correspond to a certain uh, circuit structure. So what we want, we want to hide uh, not only what exactly query, what, what is the data in the query, but also what is the type of query. And so this, this is a natural <coughs> problem. Uh, this, is, this is kind of the formalization of this problem that, that, uh, that arose from this database. OK. so. Um, so let's say we want to, uh, what would the circuit for function uh, big F look like? It will look like this, right? Um, basically, it will be a collection. This is the natural way of, of doing it, and this is the best that uh, we know to always do it. Um, uh, there would be um, a number of these sub-circuit, F1 through F30, right? Each of these will implement this, um, this, this, uh, this function that we, uh, that we look at. And then um, uh, in the bottom, so the outputs of all of these sub-circuits will be fed into the selection function, and that selection function will then uh, you know, drop the outputs of all but one of them and propagate the output of, of, of that one. Right? So here you see, if, if you have many clauses, then basically the circuit it has to evaluate all of them, because if you don't evaluate even a single one of them, then you know that that case didn't happen. And so uh, that, that leaks information. So we cannot uh, uh, we cannot do that. Um, okay. So what what can we do? And the first step is uh, kind of obvious step uh, is to realize that 
the evaluate also in a hierarchical circuit context, the, uh, the evaluator does not see, this is not what he sees, F1, F2, F3, but instead he sees only the topologies of the of uh, F1, F2, F3, and so on, right? And this is because, of course, uh, the gate functions uh, are hidden inside the carpal circuit and other techniques. So there is some caveats here because in the free XOR, the gate functions are not hidden fully because the XOR gates are, are special. You have to know where the XOR gates are. But uh, for this talk, let's ignore this. Uh, for now, I just want to say that we handle this uh, in a decent way. And it actually is the free XOR. Uh, but, um, uh, so let, let, let's just talk about the case where this is this is all that, that the uh, evaluator sees. Okay, and so now let's pretend that if we could just do this magically, uh, right, put one, you know, all of these circuits on top of each other, uh, right, uh, then the way that we can evaluate the circuit is now we can get rid of all of these extra clauses, right, and we can simply evaluate one of them because the circuit generator can program each of these 30 clauses because we just put one on top of the other, so like each one of them is possible to implement, right? So the circuit generator will simply assign the right garble table to each of these gates and send a single uh, a single uh, uh, sub circuit, and that's um, that's really uh, effective. Uh, okay, and this is basically what um, what in words in printed for the same what I uh, what I mentioned. Um, okay, so now the question is, well, so the next question is how this embedding can be done. And um, we have a theorem that's saying that this is not so simple uh, to do optimally at least. Uh, and that finding opt for set, uh, for a given set of circuits, uh, finding optimal embedding is, uh, is empty hard. So what, what can we do? So of course we can naively uh, do what, uh, what I was showing before, we can do this, right? All of this can be done, that's, that's one way, and that's, that's the, that circuit here is a circuit that is universal uh, for this set of circuits, but we want to do better. Um, another way um, is to use universal circuit, and the universal circuit is getting more attention uh, recently. Um, but the universal circuit doesn't, work too well if it's small, like smaller switches because the cost is, is, is high. The universal circuit is solving a much harder problem uh, at a much higher cost, right? So we, you know, most uh, reasonable functions that you want to compute, the naive method, will, the naive way will be better than universal circuit way because it's, it's hard to imagine like a really huge uh, conditional statement in practice. And if I looked very briefly at hand designs, how you could design those things, uh, and this is work of Paus, Schneider, and I think uh, Ahmad, I don't remember if the PSS09. Um, this was kind of more definitional thing, um, and they, they proposed some kind of ways to, to, to do this, but only for very trivial circuit combinations. And, uh, um, I think that people really don't know how to generate circuits, how to program circuits. I, I tried to talk uh, to my hardware engineers. Um, nobody really understands how circuits work. The computers generate circuits, okay, but people don't. Uh, people are not able to, to process this. Okay, so what do we want to do? Well, of course, we want to kind of like very naturally, very naively, we want you know, the circuits have some common topologies and when we put one circuit on top of the other, we want to exploit this commonality. The question is that how do you do it? It's, it's, not, uh, it's not clear. And then um, another uh, observation is that we don't have to stick to kind of our given circuits. We can massage them, we can stretch them, some branches, right? We can insert no op gates anywhere we want, uh, you know, no, uh, the, the, no operation gate that just pass through data. We can insert extra edges and so on and so forth, right? Uh, as long as uh, those operations still allow the, you know, the, the original uh, function, function of the circuit to be implemented. Um, okay, so this is, um, now I want to move from kind of circuit world into the graph world, which is kind of a, a 
kind of simple move, but uh, this was work with graph theory people, and uh, like they wouldn't <coughs> be able to understand this picture, but they would be able to understand this picture. So me and I think crypto people are sort of the same, uh, basically. So um, uh, given a circuit, uh, we we're gonna map gates. So we're gonna create a DAG, a, a graph, uh, the graph theory people understand by simply calling uh, Boolean gates, we're going to call them nodes, and the wires, we're going to call edges. And so that's, that's, that's our transformation from one wall to the other. There is a little bit more because we want to deal with the costs of the way uh, uh, of the gates. For example, you know, we want to uh, try to map that, because of free XOR, we want to try to map uh, non-free gates with non-free gates, but uh, I'm not going to talk about this now. Okay, and then um, we want to define uh, formally in the graph uh, theory world what uh, an embedding is because we're going to embed uh, circuits inside of other circuits, container circuits. So an embedding of a graph uh, D into D prime is a, is a mapping app that maps nodes uh, here into, in the graph theory lingo is uh, out arborescences, but this is basically uh, a tree, a, a, direct, a directed tree. So it maps nodes into this uh, kind of trees, and then it maps edges to edges. So this edge can be mapped into this edge, uh, right? And we want to preserve the properties. The most important one is property two. Uh, and, and this property basically ensures that we can evaluate uh, this function. Uh, so that, that, that this uh, new graph can serve as a topology for implementation of the function that was implemented by graph D. And this is ensured basically that, uh, that it preserves the flows, that any of these uh, outer variances is connected by an edge to the next one uh, according to what, what was provided in this graph. So if there is a way to program these gates and to connect to these gates, then here that would be uh, the, same, uh, the same thing. Okay, so how uh, how we can do all this? Um, the heuristic is actually relatively simple at the high level, but somehow it took a, a long time to um, to come up with it. Um, so the first observation is that the f for formulas, this is easy, um, and um, we can solve it exactly uh, pretty efficiently using uh, dynamic programming. So what we do is that given two graphs that we want to, uh, so we start with two graphs, and want to generate a third graph that embeds both, uh, both graphs, right? Um, so what we do is that for each uh, pairs of nodes uh, in graphs, we are going to uh, find the best subtree rooted at, at uh, this node B, so for each pairs of nodes, V and W, V is in D1, and W in D2, we find the best one, uh, right? And then using dynamic programming, we can keep doing it, and it will work for the entire tree. So uh, for formulas, we say that the, uh, there exists uh, an algorithm, of course, big O of the product of the sizes of the two graphs that will find the optimal embedding uh, for D1 and D2. But, um, <clears throat> but circuits is not, um, uh, formulas is not really what we want because they, uh, they're not that useful. What we really want to do is, is circuits. So this is where the heuristic uh, comes in. And the heuristic is basically to take the circuits that are given to us, then drop a bunch of edges, make a bunch of formulas out of them each circuits, and then apply the formula algorithm, and then to restore, uh, and then and see where we got. So uh, kind of a little bit in more detail, let's say D1 and D2 are the um, uh, circuits that are given. So we're going, we're going to generate a spanning forest uh, based on D1 by uh, randomly kind of choosing how we want to do it. So there is some randomness uh, in this process, a lot of randomness in this process. And we're going to drop some of the edges because we cannot not drop some of the edges because each of these has to be uh, a tree, a formula. Right? So we're going to have this bunch of uh, things. Uh, it's going to be a forest instead of a graph, instead of a 
general graph d1 going to be the spanning forest and the spanning forest here. And all of these are trees. And then we're just going to pairwise compute the best possible combinations. How you know a, a tree uh, from here will be uh, overlaid with the tree of here, right? And it's going to be a quadratic number uh, of those things. Uh, and then we calculate the cost of overlay, which means the, the, size, uh, the size of the embedding of the of the subtrees of the yes of those of, of the trees in the forest, and then. Um, uh, we choose the best uh, kind of mapping between the uh, subtrees here and here, and that's what we say. That's going to be our basis for uh, for the circuit. Um, but that's not all, because we still need to put the edges that we dropped. We need to put it back into what we received, uh, into what we did, and that creates. Um, a couple of small problems that are not too hard to solve. So one problem is that when we reinsert the edges, it can be that there could be some nodes with large fan in, and that can be expensive in garbled circuit because the cost of the garbled circuit is exponential in the number of inputs to the gate. But this is easy to solve uh, because we don't, when, when this happens, like let's say if this gate receives too many inputs, then we can split these gates into a number of gates, and then uh, you know those other inputs will be fed here, and you can see any kind of function that, uh, that you want to do. And another one is that cycles can be introduced um, in in the DAG because we, when we insert the edges that, that we drop, um, and this is an example kind of <coughs> how a cycle maybe goes like this is introduced, but. The cycles can be broken again by uh, introducing a couple of nodes, uh, and, uh, and it, it, it works out. So, um, so this at a high level, this is <clears throat> this is the heuristic, and um, basically, to again to reiterate, um, this is a probabilistic heuristic, and the, the probability, the the, uh, the random points come in here in how we are choosing to split. Uh, the circuits mm -hmm. into the sub trees, uh, and then which edges are, yeah, and which edges are dropped. So uh, you can have, um, uh, we can be lucky, and then if we, uh, if we, at random we choose the trees that map well to each other, then we're going to have a, a good uh, small container circuit, and if we are unlikely, we can have a large container circuit. So what we can do, we can keep trying until something works. And this is a slow process, and this stuff we did in. Python, so this was extra slow. Uh, but uh, the point is that this is a one-time compilation uh, expense, and once you've generated a circuit, then, uh, then you're done, and you can use it in the, the correct circuit. Um, so it's it's really hard to uh, to analytically estimate what uh, what we um, uh, what we're getting, so we did experimentally. Uh, we generated a bunch of circuits for using a CMC compiler. We tried to get as diverse circuits as possible, but there is limited number of you know, uh, smaller size circuits that make any sense. So we, we you know, we did uh, like all kinds of arithmetic operations and combinations of them, hoping that uh, this will create, you know, it will be kind of confusing for our uh, heuristic to, uh, to work. But also. At the same time, it reflects reality uh, where uh, the circuits that we're dealing with are kind of consistent basic building blocks. Um, so then, um, what we did is that, so given all these uh, 32 circuits, we did the tournament style uh, pairwise uh, competition. So we looked at all pairs <coughs> of circuits, uh, ran it for a while, and chose the lowest cost container. Uh, and this is what, what happened. Right, so, so basically, we look at the lowest cost, the, the total level, uh, round one lowest cost uh, pairing. That's what we uh, that's what we did, and then we continued. So we went from 32 circuits, uh, you know, pairwise. Uh, we generated, we got 16 circuits, right? Each of these, each of the 16 circuits, each of them uh, was able to implement two of the input circuits, and then we continued until we got uh, one circuit in the end that. Uh, uh, universal for all of these, and the number of circuits per round, uh, number of non circuits per round, uh, in total uh, of the of the two circuits, we started at, ra at round zero, where basically the input circuits had about twenty thousand gates, right? And each round was reducing 
the number of non-extra gates, and in the end, uh, this, this uh, circuit that embedded everything had uh, quite a small number of gates. So this is good, and if you have um, a uh, private function evaluation scenario where one player knows the function that he wants to compute, then you can directly use this, given this uh, um, circuit that embeds everything, you can, uh, the, the player can simply program that circuit to implement the function that he wants to use, and then, uh, so there's no extra overhead compared to, to standard uh, garbled circuit, for example. But um, if we go to, uh, to generic, uh, the general secure computation, and your, your conditional statement is validated based on the internal variable, then that doesn't work. And so, uh, so what works? And you can think of a naive, uh, sort of the most straightforward way is that the circuit garbler can generate, you know, those k uh, garblings. So you have k, the k clauses in your conditional statement, and then you generate k garblings. And then you do OT where one of these 32 is sent, right? So that's fine, but it doesn't uh, actually work because under the hood in OT, you have to send all of those k encryptions, right? And, they, and that's the cost that that cost will be equal to uh, to uh, sending all all of those uh, uh, in, uh, using a naive method where you just just send them all. Um, so what you can do is that <coughs> instead of generating k garblings, you could generate uh, k programming strings, where programming strings uh, consist of uh, a number of uh, uh, elements, like a number of bits, the, the positions, where each position says which gate function is assigned to this gate and this gate, right? And then you do the OT on the programming strings, and the evaluator receives the programming string, and then he uses the programming string to run the OT per gate. So then, so now. Uh, Per gate, when we evaluate this, we're going to run one out of small number of OT. It doesn't depend on the number of clauses. It's going to be one out of five. Because there's, you know, there's three possible gate functions that you can have. And then we introduce a couple of additional gates of gate functions because you want to do like a pass through gate, uh, things like that. So you do one out of five um, OT. You do have to do a, a, an additional trick because you can't just uh, let the, um, the uh, evaluator learn the programming function. Learn which function being evaluated, but you can mask it, uh, and then during the government transfer, you can unmask it. So this works. Um, okay, and um, so this cost is kind of significant, actually, and uh, our kind of naive, you know, relative. The simple calculation shows that we are about 13 times lower compared to this um, to the uh, top gates. Um, so to break even, we we need to have a, a larger clauses. Uh, we expect to break even 64 circuit, uh, and I think we can do better with optimizations. But um, if we go, if we don't do the garble circuit approach, but we do GMW approach, then we can do actually uh, much better. It's okay. Um, and the intuition uh, why GMW works better. So. Um, let's see if I can just convey the, uh, the intuition. Uh, the main cost, <coughs> uh, if you're doing the garble circuit approach, uh, the reason why the OT of the whole thing uh, doesn't work well, uh, because you need to send long secrets. So the whole, the entire garbling uh, is one long secret, uh, right? And if, you, if you're doing one out of KOT, then you need to send K of those long secrets. But if you are, um, in the GMW uh, case, that the secrets that you're running, in, you're sending inside the OT, they're short, they're one-bit secrets, because they're just shares uh, of the wire. And, um, and and because of that, you can you can send a larger number uh, of, of secrets uh, for cheap. Um, and I guess I don't have time to go into more detail. Uh, but just kind of to state the, um, uh, the result in the GMW, uh, you, can, uh, you can have GMW gates with multiple inputs with, let's say, eight 
uh, binary inputs at the cost that is kind of comparable uh, to the um, uh, to the thing that's with two input uh, double gates. So this is this is uh, this observation we made, and this observation was made uh, uh, independently, concurrently by the uh, work of um, uh, a number of authors. Mm -hmm. Thomas Schneider, one of the authors, and that paper was on uh, titled something like uh, "Computing on the Lookup Tables" or something like that. Uh, but uh, anyway, so in the GMW setting, the circuit reduction that we get it directly uh, maps into the performance. In the evaluation, and there is no um, additional overhead due to this need for um, uh, for the OTs. And that's uh, that's it. Thank you very much.